So, hello everyone and welcome. This is Careers in Allied Health. Um, so Annette and I were kind of thinking about this panel event. We've done it for a lot of different majors, but specifically um, looking at our allied health majors, we know nursing is a big one, um, and, but we also get one, a lot of students who are really interested in nursing, but would like to learn more about nursing. So we do have nurses um, on the call today that you can learn more from. Um, but also that just students in general know that maybe they want to do something in healthcare and aren't sure what all the options are. So we also brought in some other individuals who work within the healthcare system doing different things. And you may find as they're sharing what they do, that really that's what you are interested in or that's what you would like to um, learn more about and explore. And so this is um, just a chance for you to learn more about different careers in the healthcare system. Um, I see most of you have your cameras off, so um, I'm gonna, um, I think it'll make it easier as far as saving bandwidth and then also um, just focus if we can uh, just have the panelists will have their um, cameras on. And then at the end, um, as people are asking questions and stuff, then um, you can turn your cameras off and we can, or turn your cameras back on and we can have all sorts of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna start off by introducing um, our services at the Career Center. Um, so my name is Lena and I work at the Career Center here at Miramar College. Um, we help students with exploring majors. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one appointments. We look at resumes, mock in, do mock interviews. So anything you can think of um, from career exploration all the way to being able to get a job, um, that's a lot of what we do. So specifically if after this event, you're thinking, you know, maybe you're on a, the track to um, do nursing and then you were listening to someone um, talk a little bit more about respiratory therapy and that got you thinking about a career in respiratory therapy and you want to talk more about that, then we're here for you. We're doing one-on-one -on -one appointments um, right now. Um, we have our information on how to do that on the on our website. So if you just put in, if you just Google San Diego Miramar College Career Center, we come up. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. So I'm going to pass it along to um, Annette. Hi everyone. My name is Annette Ignacio and I'm a counselor in the Transfer Center. And thank you to all of our speakers that have joined us today. We know it's a crazy busy time and we really appreciate you being with us. And thank you to the students for being here. I'm just gonna share my screen with you quickly. Uh, students, please make sure that you sign up for our Canvas page on the Transfer Center website. This is how we are interacting with students this year since we're on you know, we're all remote, so please just click here. Uh, in the Transfer Center, we have a variety of resources and workshops that will help you transfer to that four-year institution. So we definitely recommend that you reach out to us. We have workshops that talk about the eligibility requirements to transfer to a CSU or a UC. We have workshops that talk about applying to nursing school or medical school. We also have counselors in the Transfer Center, such as myself and Sandy Gonzalez, that will meet with students to kind of review your plan for transfer, help you identify universities that you want to transfer to. This is our events page on our Miramar College website. Again, these are some workshops that you might be interested in. We also post different things that are going on with the different campuses. We are working with admissions representatives from the CSUs and UCs who are meeting with our students individually and also giving workshops. So again, even though we're online, we have a lot of great resources for you and please reach out to us. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Isabella from General Counseling. Hi, Annette. Thanks. Do we need to stop sharing the screen or it's fine if we are? Um, <laughs> hi, hi, everyone. I'm Isabella Feldman. I work in General Counseling. Um, so yes, everything's kind of remote right now, but we do a little bit of everything. So the better question is, what do we not do? Um, we do everything from certificates to associate degrees to let's say you transferred from a different college and 
You want to know how your transfer credits go through. We also do specialize in transfer as well. Um, I would say we're just like a little bit of everything to kind of go see your general practitioner. Um, we kind of specialize in everything. So right now um, we have email counseling. We also have half an hour Zoom appointments and we have one hour Zoom appointments and all that information can be found on our website. And um, anytime you need anything, you're able to reach out to us and we will be getting back to you. And the Zoom appointments have actually been working really, really well. So don't hesitate to make one of those. Thanks. Thank you, Isabella. And then I also wanted to um, introduce Connie um, for a minute or, um, and if you wanna just um, kind of transition us. So Connie, um, for those of you who don't know, um, Connie works a little bit behind the scenes, so it, um, as opposed to like working face-to-face -face with students on a regular basis. But um, really at the community college, our goal here is that you all have degrees that are gonna be able to help you enter into the workforce. And um, Connie does a lot of the research specifically within the healthcare sector. So Connie, if you wanna just briefly introduce um, what you do and how that um, relates to what the students do in their day-to-day -day, um, classes. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Lena, for inviting us. Um, uh, you know, my role is a regional director for employer engagement for the health sector. So pre pretty much I have uh, three primary roles. One is to engage employers and understand what are the skills, abilities, and the, the uh, occupation opportunities they have and the demanding occupations. So um, it's constantly being part of collaborating with them. And with that, I want to thank Ryan here. He's my to-go guy for anything that I need at Sharp Hospital. So thank you so much, Ryan, for all your support. Um, it really means a lot to us at a community college level. And I know you have a lot of passion to help our students. So thank you. And also want to thank Gary Phelps. Thank you, Gary, for joining us. And we're very much looking forward to having you with us. So that's what that's one of my roles is to be able to connect community colleges to employers and to bring employers, um, um, you know, to advisory boards or just uh, uh, work with them in order to understand better their needs. The other part of my job is to work with community colleges and assess the needs for pro professional development. If there is a need that you have and uh, um, in terms of learning new skill sets or learning something that you will translate into helping students in the classroom, please let me know. I am happy to work in helping provide that. And now I'm also working with a K through 14 a professional development coordinator and um, she's also focusing on professional development. So it's something that we can collaborate. And the third part of my role is to work with my statewide director under the chancellor's office and provide information on anything that has to do with waivers, governor waivers, regulations, reporting systems, and anything that comes from the state. So you might see, especially I work closely with deans and CTE deans and program directors and I'm constantly sending out information that is coming down from um, Sacramento or, or throughout the state. So that's just briefly of some of the things I do. Thank you, Connie. And so yeah, since um, our panel today is um, connected to healthcare, I thought she'd be a great um, addition to have. Um, and so also, I'm not sure how long you'll be able to stay on the call with us, but if you're at the end, um, and students, if you have specific questions for Connie, um, that would be good to just think while she's here of um, what some of the things you might want to ask her. Um, oh, I'm going to put my email um, on the chat box, and uh, I'm here to serve you, so just reach out to me whenever you need it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I see the panelists on my screen in a certain order, so I will ask them questions, or I'll have them first start introducing themselves in that order, and that'll kind of be the order that we um, keep um, up with for our time. Um, the first question that, or first what we'll start with is just introducing yourself, um, what you do, and then I know some of you also have um, different roles you've had, in healthcare in the either in the past or that you have now so you can you know whatever makes sense for what your current role is or um, your position feel free to um, share about both current and past positions as well so we'll go ahead and get started with miss Brittany Harvey take it away 
Woohoo! Starting it out. So I'm Brittany. I have been a nurse for seven years. I graduated in 2013. Um, I started out as a sitter in a hospital straight out of high school, did that for a couple of years, then transitioned into a position as like a unit secretary, putting in orders, um, just basically supporting the unit, and then um, completed a four-year degree and got my bachelor's. Um, from there, worked inpatient and night shift on an oncology med surge floor. So oncology, um, just for basics is cancer care. So chemotherapy, um, managing people post-operatively, things like that. Um, so I worked there for about a year and a half and then I started doing travel nursing, which is a cool opportunity that after you've gotten some of your basics for nursing, you can actually do that as kind of like contract work where you do three month stints in different locations. So that kind of allowed me to work in Colorado for three months, working in an outpatient infusion center. I've worked in Napa Valley for three months, drinking wine and also working night shift inpatient. Um, I worked at City of Hope, which is out in the LA area for three months and then kind of transitioned back into inpatient, or not inpatient, but as a permanent position um, so I've worked in a few different realms, inpatient, um, as a floor nurse, as well as outpatient in an infusion center doing chemotherapy, as well as outpatient working in radiation as well. So um, that's kind of my background, has been pretty much all oncology, all cancer care and managing patients kind of from diagnosis to procedures to infusions and things like that. Um, and that's really my background. So I do, I am certified in infusion for chemotherapy, um, administering those medications, and then currently working locally here, um, primarily managing one provider's entire clinic as far as doing all the educations for all the new start chemotherapy, setting them up for their infusions, coordinating with radiation. So that's probably my favorite part is that there's a lot of opportunities to kind of transition through different things based on kind of what fits your stage of life, what you need for your schedule, and also what piques your interest as far as different like treatment modalities or different, I don't know, just different stages of nursing. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go next to Rashia Jackson. Hi. Um, yes, um, my name is Raisha Jackson, and I am currently working with Developmental Screening and Enhancement Program at Rady Children's Hospital. Um, a little bit of my background is prior to moving to San Diego, I was a child life specialist in a children's hospital in Texas. So it was the big children's hospital, kind of like our main one. And then we have a small rehabilitation hospital in Texas. I did that for about seven to eight years and then moved to sunny San Diego. Um, and now at another children's hospital, which is Brady's. And so the program that I currently work for as a developmental specialist is um, what's called the DSEP program. It is development, I mean, uh, developmental screen and enhancement program. And what we do is that we are contracted with the county to provide uh, behavior and developmental uh, screenings for all little ones who are in foster care. And so what does that look like? Because that's like, oh, that's a lot. Um, so we actually meet with bio parents, well, biological parents and foster parents to work with them and to support children from zero to six, um, with providing them with services and advocating for them to ensure that their needs are met. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome and important work. Um, and next, I'll have Mr. Gary Phelps. Hi, how's everyone doing today? Uh, my name is Gary Phelps. I'm the manager of uh, Pulmonary at Sharp Grossmont Hospital here in San Diego. Um, my career started off not too much different than everybody else's, but um, right out of high school, I graduated and joined the Navy. Um, in the Navy, I went through my hospital corpsman training and started off you know, at a very basic level. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I went through respiratory therapy school in the military. Uh, so went through the program at uh, Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, and then came out to San Diego and you know, 
spent some time overseas in the Middle East during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Um, and then when I went to go back to Vermont and saw it was too cold back in March, I decided to come back out to San Diego and stay. And this has been my permanent residence ever since. Um, I've been doing this for way too long, it seems like, uh, 33 years, um, uh, uh, right out of high school, basically. So in respiratory therapy, I've done everything from, you know, uh, working with neonates in the, in the NICU, labor and delivery, um, all the way through geriatrics, ER, trauma, um, any of those types of um, scenarios. Um, as a respiratory therapist, we care for anybody with breathing and, and respiratory issues and, and, and complications. So I've um, uh, run the gamut from my time in the Middle East as a therapist to the, you know, the bedsides here. I've done everything from a staff therapist role to a clinical specialist slash educator um, to now running a department of about 140, 145 staff. Um, so it is quite challenging and exciting at the same time. I still get to see a lot of things. I still get to participate. I still get to show everybody that I am not just a figurehead. I can actually practice and still perform the, the tasks at hand. And I try to stay up on the, um, uh, the, the current standards and bring everybody up to, you know, the current speed of, you know, what's current in the literature and, and keep the practice, you know, viable, exciting, and, and uh, vibrant. Thank you, Gary. And um, we will bring it over to Christina. Hi there. I'm actually the director of clinical education and I'm an instructor at Orange Coast College for the respiratory care program there. So hi Gary, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Pauli. Um, I also am a therapist, a respiratory therapist. I'm still practicing at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach and I've been there for uh, a little over 10 years. I have been a respiratory therapist for almost 13 years and I love my job, absolutely love it. I think um, my passion as a young girl um, to be, you know, I was always playing school. I don't know if kids do that anymore. Do they still play school? <laughs> I played school when I was little. So education was always very important to me. It was always something that I had a passion for. and. Wow, what a way to blend both worlds for me, you know, to be able to still practice um, in healthcare, something that I had a passion for, and to be an educator too. I think uh, it was just the best of both worlds. So I'm still doing both and I, I'm really enjoying it. Like Gary, I've kind of gone through um, little bits and pieces, different departments. Um, my main passion right now is to work with adult critical care and trauma. Um, I really love my adult patients. Um, I'm always in the, I'm, I usually I'm in the neuro ICU. Um, so see a lot of stroke patients. Um, we're by the beach. And so we see a lot of surfing accidents and um, things like that. So that has always interested me as well. Um, I do also have, um, when I was going to school for respiratory, I would uh, moonlight as a sleep tech. So I on the, got on the job training as a sleep technician. So diagnosing different sleep disorders. So I have a lot of experience in that realm too. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. You um, have me thinking what it's gonna look like to play school in the future. So I just, <laughs> but um, we'll continue with our panel. Um, so if you all could share, you know, share a little bit about what you, do um, what your current role or past roles have been. If you could um, walk our students through what some of your um, education and or experience that helped prepare you for this position is. And if you could um, narrow it down to one skill that you're really happy you brought into your current um, position, um, that would also help us a little bit. Thank you. And then um, back to Brittany. So education that prepared me for my role. I have a bachelor's degree in nursing. So my BSN is really what opened a lot of doors for me for this position. Um, and then 
one skill that I'm happy to have brought with me. Um, like I mentioned, kind of initially, I started out working as a sitter, which is kind of like a, it sounds bad, but it's kind of like a glorified adult babysitter. When you're in the hospital, your job is to make sure they're not pulling their IVs out. They're not getting out of bed and falling and causing themselves any harm or injury for patients that are confused or might not really understand where they are. Um, so I would honestly say that was probably my hardest job I've ever had because you're working with adults. And I was 18 and I was like, I'm trying to keep you safe, but this is very uncomfortable. Um, but I would say that as far as skills that I learned in that position was having uncomfortable conversations, um, being able to do provide an education in a way that was um, respectful to their position because knowing that they're adults and that they've been there, they've done a lot with their lives. This is not their best position they've ever been in. So being able to utilize good communication probably is one of the things that I'm really thankful for that formation of that skill set during that position, um, regardless of how difficult it was. But I think that that translates into every area of healthcare, I think probably because you're able to provide education in a way that's respectful to the person you're talking to, but also gets the point across for the urgency or the concern for safety um, in different settings. So those would be my, that would be my thought. Thank you, Brittany. And Rashia? Couldn't get to the mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, so my what my degrees are i am double majored in psychology and rehabilitation and a minor in child development and then i have my master's in family and child development with the focus of child life and so those degrees prepared me to be a child life specialist and um they also kind of transitioned into me being a developmental specialist because of the developmental background and one skill that I am happy that I have learned over the years is advocating and advocating for families, um, advocating for children, but also advocating for yourself in these roles, especially when you are in a new role or um, in my position, we do what's called child and family team meetings. And so when you have a family or a mom that's really, really nervous to even speak up for herself, um, teaching her how to advocate, so modeling, but also advocating for her of like, it's okay, this is your child. So um, that is one skill that I am glad I have learned. Thank you. Gary? Uh, I have a bachelor's of science in uh, advanced patient care and um, professional development and a master's in public health. Um, those degrees have come, you know, in, you know, great use um, during my um, current position. But the, the skills and talents that I've um, developed over the years that have really helped me were patience and empathy. Um, because you know there are times where you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes, especially when you're in leadership. Uh, you have to be able to um, relate to the person who's sitting across from you, getting the feedback. And sometimes it's hard to deliver that in an effective way if everybody's on edge and and feeling um, like they're going to lose their job or they're going to be in some type of punitive state. And most of the time, they've already um, beat themselves up enough. There's no reason for you to have to, you know hammer that tack in with a sledgehammer. There's, you, there's a little bit of finesse that you can use and, uh, and, and skills to, to communicate your point without having to you know, berate the, the other person. So I think those are some of the skills that have really helped foster me and grow in my current role. Thank you, Gary. And um, Christina? You can um, share a little bit of your background, but since you're on the education side as well, if you could um, share possibly also some of the other options um, and the degrees you offer at OCC. Specifically sure. related to respiratory therapy. You don't have to um, share all the OCC degrees. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have my associates in science and respiratory care. I also have my bachelor's in healthcare administration. Um, and so that has really, really helped me. Um, I think one skill that I believe has really helped me is my ability to work under pressure. So um, maybe it's the fact that I have four kids and I have a husband um, who, Brittany could probably relate to this, 
who was diagnosed with colon cancer some time back, and he's had seven surgeries um, to date, you know, in the last few years. So being able to juggle all of that, um, I think it, it was just, I don't think I would have been able to deal with all of that if I didn't have that skill and being able to handle that because you're going to have situations in, in healthcare where it is not only consuming of your time and energy, but mentally, it could be mentally exhausting. And I think um, being able to know how to hone that in and um, utilize coping mechanisms is, is going to be very, very important, especially given the situ current situation we're in. You know, as healthcare providers, being able to be able to utilize those coping skills. So I, I'm glad that I was taught um, how to do that. But it's something that could be learned as well. So, um, but I do appreciate the fact that I was thrown in very early in my career into trauma, into critical care. So having that skill set um, really helped me manage not only my patients, but my relationships with other employees as well. So that was good. As far as other degrees at um, our college that kind of relate, we do have a, a cross training program for polysomnography. Um, so if any of our students wish to go the route of respiratory therapy, they can cross train into the sleep world and cross train into the polysomnography program and get an accelerated uh, degree in that as well. So I think that that is um, really neat. And I think we're the only in the area, the only public college that offers uh, that polysomnography program. Great to know. Um, uh, next question. If you could share um, one thing about your position um, or past related positions that surprised you, and it could be something that um, was either positive, maybe it's been a challenge, or it can just be something indifferent that you weren't expecting. So, starting with Brittany. The mute button, just like Raisha, it, it was avoiding me, sorry. Um, so I would probably say something that surprised me in a good way was kind of how the skills of my initial training as far as being inpatient translated to different sites of being able to transition to working outpatient, working in chemotherapy, working in radiation, just kind of how those different pieces all allowed me to transition to different um, areas depending on what I was interested in or what I wanted to learn at the time or what patient population I wanted to work with. Um, and that's one thing that I really appreciate about nursing is that I have friends also who have gone from working in like a med surge to working in like a psych area to working in a NICU, just different opportunities that those baseline skills allow you to transition um, depending on where you find your passion. Um, I initially was a part of a new grad program, which is essentially, it's a six week program where each week you're put into a different specialty to kind of see what you like. And that's something that I also think was really helpful as a new grad, um, just being able to try different things because what I learned in clinicals wasn't always what I experienced in real life in the hospital. Um, so just kind of getting the opportunity to see different areas and kind of find out what my niche was. And then if I wanted to switch that niche, I could, which I think is a really cool opportunity that a lot of things outside of healthcare don't really afford you that opportunity in the same way. Thank you. And Rashia. Um, so for me, two things surprised me. The first one is um, when I started as a child life specialist, I just assumed I was going to be working with children and only children. And then, well, as we all know, children comes with parents. So you are now working with adults. So <laughs> I think for me, that was a huge lesson to learn, of, especially like when your child is in the hospital. And of course, they have parents and the parents are coming in. The parents are scared also because they have as many questions as the child does. And so preparing the parents and also the child 
which was like, which is such a huge thing for me of like, because it goes back to teaching and modeling. Um, and then the second part is the job that I currently have at Radies, which is the developmental specialist and learning case management. So learning how to um, create individual care plans and then really having to teach what an individual care plan is, what does that look like, our action plan, our action steps, and then ensuring that um, the case documents and notes are always up to date because everything, as we know, is time stamped. And so if I see you on a Monday, my notes need to be in by a certain time. And so making sure like, oh, did I put that note in? Or just having a really good organizational um, organize organizational skills to create that case management. So. Thank you. And yeah, in the chat, Ryan pointed out excellent point that um, children do come with adults. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to pipe in on that. Um, that that I don't want to say I couldn't say it better than you. Uh, um, I'm a parent of two young children, so I'm, I'm that person that you have to deal with as well, but it is totally true. And anybody who works in pediatrics, you know, the, the children are lovely. It's actually the parents, like me, that are, that are more challenging. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> yes. Um, and Gary, if you'd like to share a little bit about something that surprised you about um, either respiratory therapy or um, your current role, either one. Well, there's a lot of stuff that surprised me in respiratory therapy. Like when I first got into the role, um, uh, first of all, was when I was 19 years old, having to take care of you know preterm infants that could fit in the palm of your hand. I mean, that was a that was a shocker. Um, and then being a guy, not wanting to deal with the the babies and go into that realm uh, because of fear and the unknown, um, certainly was um, you know uncomfortable. But then I soon learned, soon learned to um, embrace that and enjoy it because it ended up uh, uh, making me a, a stronger clinician. It uh, gave me some autonomy. It allowed me to actually act as a, an advanced practitioner. And you know, next thing you know, we're um, doing all the resuscitation and we're pushing the physician aside because they're interns and residents and didn't really know what was going on. Um, so we were intubating the kids and putting in lines and doing all sorts of things that you know really the advanced practitioner would really do. Uh, so those things are kind of exciting, and then you know just the uh, the shock and awe of working in a trauma center and and seeing some of the things that come through your doors. Um, that was a, an uncomfortable um, surprise, but yet at the same time it was um, very rewarding and, and provided a lot of growth. And then in my current role, and just to jump around a lot. Uh, keep you guys on your toes. Uh, my current role and position provided me with, um, you know, a, a tremendous surprise on how broken my staff were when I first got here about two years ago. Um, there was an obvious lack of, um, of good leadership, not that I'm great or good in any capacity, but um, I do tend to lend a, a listening ear. I try to provide sound, reasonable advice. I do have the working knowledge of the profession so I can actually provide them some comfort and some guidance, which they haven't had in, gosh, probably 10 years. And that's taken a very broken, disruptive staff um, and brought it into more of a, uh, a less broken and more functional uh, you know, group of individuals. And I think they actually feel appreciated because they're actually being supported. They're not being, um, you know, raked over the coals by everybody under the sun just because of the fact that they're respiratory therapists or you know, they feel less than um, you know a, a full participant in the care of the patient. Uh, they're now being represented and you know I don't have a problem throwing myself in front of the, the daggers and the, uh, the other uh, things that are coming at them in order to help buffer that. And so, you know, as a leader, uh, it doesn't matter what line of work you're in, whether it's healthcare or some other type of, of industry. If you want to go into the leadership role, you have to be able to take the, um, uh, the hits for your staff. You have to be able to represent them, not unjustly. Um, of course, if they deserve, you know, the, the things that are coming at them, you know, that's, that's on them. But if I can soften that blow, if I can provide them a little bit of comfort, if I can provide them the support that they need in order to get through that crisis, then that I've done my job. Um, and that becomes very challenging at times and becomes difficult. And it's 
just um, amazing on how much of that I had to do at the very beginning when I first got here. And now I still have to do it. It just seems to be on a, a, a lot less of a intense um, battle every single time that I, I have to go up and, and support them. And I think it's um, being appreciated and it's being seen and, and, you know, I'm starting to, you know, reap the rewards for the efforts that I put into it. Thank you, Gary. And for um, our students, I know many of you are still in a position where you're trying to declare a major. And so management may seem like a, um, something that's very far off, but um, it's good to just be keeping at the back of your mind as you think about what are other options or opportunities you may eventually want to go into. Again, it would be you know, possibly a little bit further down in your career, but um, just something to kind of be thinking about and be gaining and be working towards those skills as you enter into your, your first positions. Um, and then Christina, if you'd like to share um, something about your role that um, surprised you. Well, I think something that surprised me, I think Gary kind of touched on this a little bit, is the autonomy that I was going to be afforded. I, I think it comes down to really being um, very inquisitive and a lifelong learner. Um, I didn't realize all the different roles I could play within as a respiratory therapist within a hospital setting. You know, I thought I would just go in, go to work, do some breathing treatments, maybe help manage a patient on life support. Um, but then I started because I was inquisitive, because I wanted to learn, I was very um, interested in learning about like patient, the patient experience. I was very interested in learning about quality improvements. And that's why I got my bachelor's in healthcare administration um, was that next thing you know, I'm being put on to these different committees. So I'm like being represented, I'm representing the respiratory department in different committees, um, the skin quality committee, um, the patient experience committee. Um, I'm revising policies and procedures. So that was very surprising. I, I never even thought going to respiratory school that I would be able to um, venture out into different roles, um, different aspects of respiratory that really will help our patients in the long run. All these improvements, all these different committees, it, it's all about patient-centered care. You know, where we talk about patient-centered care and healthcare, and um, I was excited and I was very appreciative of that experience to be able to go into those different roles. But it was surprising to me, um, but I love it. I love that I was able to, to do all that. Thank you, Christina. Um, so a lot of you all on the panel represent some of the biggest names in healthcare in San Diego. Um, if you could share one thing um, specifically that you really enjoy about your um, employer, so our students can kind of get thinking as they're thinking about internships or where they want to volunteer, what are some of the things that make um, the, and you can share um, specifically where you're working right now, um, what makes it unique and what you really enjoy? Brittany. So I work over at Scripps in their outpatient uh, Geisel Pavilion and one thing that I appreciate about Scripps is that they're really supportive in continuing education so I know that if you go into Scripps and you have different certifications that you want to get to kind of specialize down into different departments or if you want to do continuing education and go and move forward into like um, different, what am I trying to think? Like different roles, like advanced degrees, things like that. There is education money that you can utilize for that once you've been there for a little bit. Um, and also I was just recently learning that there's also transition programs where um, my ultrasound tech was telling me that she knew that if I wanted to move into labor and delivery or something that she said there was like a 13 week program they offered to anybody who already like worked in scripts to transition from whatever unit they were in to go into that specialty. So I think just those really cool opportunities to continuing your education um, and having them kind of help 
pay for that is a really nice opportunity um, because those things are expensive. And I think a lot of the providers probably in San Diego, the big names, a lot of those have been pretty good about doing that. But that's one thing that I think is really great that Scripps offers um, is the continuing education dollars to kind of help you to become more of an expert in your area and also to opportun opportunities to transition to other areas as well or further degrees as well. Thank you, Brittany. And this year. Um, I am agreeing with Brittany, especially for Radies, um, because we, um, they focus on continuing education a lot also. And in addition, um, I wanted to say the leadership. Our leadership team is so supportive. So when Gary was talking about how he came in and then transitioned it, I want to hand clap you, hand clap to you only because like leadership to me is so important because if you do not have a strong leadership, um, because they're basically leading you, but also modeling how you're supposed to do or be in the program, and so having that leadership, especially at Radies, that we can come talk to, have those difficult conversations and feel comfortable without any retaliation or um, that you will get um, in trouble, that it's so important. So for Radies, I would say the leadership and also the continuing education. Thank you. And Gary. Wow. Um I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh, Raisha and Brittany have pretty pretty much covered all of it. I mean, all of our major um, institutions in healthcare in San Diego are pretty much the same. I came from Scripps originally, uh, spent 26 years there. The thing that made me jump ship and come over to Sharp was the, uh, an opportunity to lead. And, uh, you know, the organization's equally as great. Um, you can't make any mistakes or, or errors in choosing a healthcare uh, facility to, to work at. Um, the Sharp system is is awesome. I mean, they're they're very supportive. They provide you autonomy, but at the same time, hold you accountable for your um, uh, your role and and your budgets and everything else that you um, you know have underneath your scope of practice uh, uh, or your realm of responsibilities. So those are all great, and then they encourage you to to get your education and you know and and you know you you just have the support and. Uh, and the comfort of knowing that you know they're there to support you in everything that you do and um, as you're moving forward they're going to um, be right there and and hold you up if you start to stumble so uh, you can't go wrong all the healthcare institutions are doing pretty much the same thing and at least in the san diego area uh, from my experience years ago i worked at radies as well um, but you know we, we all move around. We, we just have to find the opportunities that work best for us. And then, you know, again, the benefits and the, um, uh, the support that you get from these organizations, they wouldn't be around if they didn't uh, look after their leaders or their, their staff. Uh, they would just, just go under or they would just be um, uh, just miserable places to work and we wouldn't be on this panel. Thank you, Gary um, and Christina. Well, my, my role as an educator at Orange Coast College, I, I think I was also a student there. I went to school there uh, for respiratory therapy. I think one thing that truly impresses me, and I hear from other students too, is they feel like they're walking onto a university campus. So you're, it's a community college, but the, it's just such a high quality um, education at such a low cost. And I really appreciate the support and the resources that we have available to us. I think we really can teach our students um, how it is to be out in the field effectively if we don't have the resources. So I, I really appreciate that I do have those resources available. It makes my job easier, especially during this time. It's been very difficult. So I appreciate the resources and I, I just, I feel it's a very supportive campus. I love the fact that we do have that cross training um, available um, and we support many clinical sites in, in the South Orange County area. So um, 
hopefully will be expanding um, more toward the San Diego area to support those students who actually travel um, to Costa Mesa um, and um, Orange County uh, for the purpose of their education. So, and we try to be very flexible with our students. Um, since I'm the clinical director, I am making sure I make sure I know where everyone lives and be able to help support them accordingly. Thank you, Christina. And then I also just wanted to um, point out that, um, so Christina's at um, Orange Coast Community College um, and really in the Southern California areas, that is if you're interested in respiratory therapy, that's one of your um, best and closest options. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, if there's other <laughs> things within San Diego or whatnot. Um, but as far as I know, um, OCC is one of the main um, training opportunities and places to get education in respiratory therapy in Southern California. Is that, is that accurate? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think because we're a public institution too and a community college, again, I think we, you know, there are private institutions and they're great and they offer great programs, but you know, when we talk about the cost to our students and trying to provide a high quality education at a low cost, I, I think we're one of the best. And so I, I really enjoyed my time as a student there. So, and I try to make that experience just as welcoming and um, effective for the current students that we have. Thank you, Christina. Um, and last, um, I was just gonna ask our panelists to kind of wrap up um, and maybe going back to the beginning of your journey, like I said before, a lot of our students are at a place where they're either trying to narrow down a major or kind of they're currently allied health majors and trying to figure out what's next as far as transfer options. Um, so for the student who knows that they want to get into healthcare, they want to help people in some sort of setting, do you have any advice for how to really um, narrow down what's going to be the best fit for them? And maybe if you're um, willing to share a little bit how you um, came to that decision. Going back to Brittany. So I would say I'm probably a weirdo because I knew I wanted to be a nurse when I was two. My mom's a labor and delivery nurse. My grandma's a peds nurse. So I just had never met anybody else who loved their jobs like my mom and my grandma did and kind of came home every day, not mad or <laughs> angry about anything. They just loved what they did. Um, so I kind of knew that I wanted to be in healthcare. Um, from a really young age. So that wasn't um, something that I really struggled with, but I would really recommend for people who are not sure to kind of talk to different people in different roles. Panels like this, I think are helpful because you get to kind of see different personalities of different people and just kind of recognize that all different personalities can do all different roles and be successful in them. Um, because there's just so many different facets in healthcare. Um, and then also just kind of for me in nursing kind of figuring out what i wanted to do as far as specializing um if you would have asked me if i would be in oncology i would have said absolutely not it's too sad blah 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 i always wanted to do actually pediatric oncology was where i wanted to start and now i'm like woo, parents would be really intense so i'm not upset that i just get to deal with the wives and the husbands and the children and the moms and dads of all these patients that I deal with because regardless of what area of healthcare you're working with people. So um, I think probably I would recommend that if you're going into nursing looking for like a new grad program that allows you to kind of see all the different specialties, especially in the hospital or healthcare system that you're looking to work in. Um, and like I said, I graduated seven years ago and I know that there's I don't know if Scripps or um, Sharp or all the different facilities here offer those as much in the area, but I do know that that is something that I really found valuable to help me kind of figure out what area I wanted to actually like move forward and specialize in, but also remembering that this isn't like my ending point. I can always kind of adjust depending on where I'm at and kind of what I like to do, kind of like you've heard with Gary and Christina and everybody else that you kind of start in one area and then you kind of move to where your passion leads you. And that's the nice part about healthcare is there's flexibility because we're not going to be replaced by robots because a robot can't check somebody the way that a human does. So um, those are my, <laughs> that's my thoughts. 
Thank you, Brittany. That's a great point that um, the decision you make today is not, you know, necessarily where, where you'll be in 20, 30, 40 years. And so there's always going to be opportunities. Um, Ashia, if you'd like to share a little bit. Thank you. Um, yes. And I agree with Brittany when you were talking, I had a flashback of what one of my professors said that um, you will have at least three to four careers throughout your life. So that being said, I would say um, my advice would be to do, if, especially if you're not sure, either shadow if you can, COVID is a little different, but if even if you can try to do informational interviews, which is just getting people on the phone and calling, have a list of um, questions that you really want to know of like, well, what does your day look like? Um, how did you get started? What is your passion? Why did you pick this um, program versus this program? Or um, what would you ask a new grad? Or what would you ask even in high school? Like, what would you ask a person in high school that's interested in being a director? How, what does that path look like? Um, so really using your resources, one, and that's just Google. Google is our best friends now, but also, um, I would say also using your network. Um, if you know somebody that is doing something that you already want to do, talk to them, ask them, ask them if you can shadow. Again, uh, we're in COVID, so <laughs> if it's only, able, if you're only able, but if not, ask if you can have a Zoom meeting with them. Um, I do say persistence um, wins the race because at the end of the day, like if you put in the work, you will reap the benefits. Um, so really just going out and seeing what you want to do, information interviews, and seeing if you can shadow in the new world, I guess we should say. So. Thank you. And um, even though we are in the middle of a pandemic, I've been surprised how much is available virtual. I mean, look at us here. Here we all are. Um, and even I've seen um, actually like workplace tours done virtually and such. So um, students, if you need um, help getting connected to some of those resources, we are in the business of being creative and can help with that as well. Um, Gary, if you'd like to share. Um, you know, again, you know, everybody's hitting some good points. Uh, if you know somebody in that realm or that, that profession, certainly reach out to them and, and speak to them. Uh, you can talk to counselors. Uh, you can go out to the different professional sites and, and, and do a look up to see what kind of um, uh, work that each career does. You can go on to the radiology site. You can go on to respiratory care sites. You can go on to nursing and, you know, laboratory. There, there are a number of different places where you can find the information. Uh, look up the professional organizations. Uh, you know, most of them have a national and a state organization for respiratory. There's the American Academy of Respiratory Care or, uh, or so Amer American Association for Respiratory Care. Uh, it's a national site. Uh, California Society for Respiratory Care is the, the state site. Um, there's a lot of information available on those, uh, you know, places. The Respiratory Care Board uh, also provides you more information as to the respiratory profession. The different other professions in the in, in healthcare also have similar boards or, or associations in which you can find information. You can also reach out to those folks and talk to a representative and they can provide you information over the phone or, or, or contacts at other um, institutions like people like myself or, or Christina or Brittany or Raisha, um, to, to, uh, to, to get that information, to find that, um, uh, to ask those pointed questions, to, to get the, the information that you need in order to make a sound decision. Don't just jump into something because you think it's great because you might not be happy with it. You need to know what you're getting into first. Um, and that way you don't have to make three, four or five different uh, career changes. You might be able to stick with one like me and be, be semi happy with it. Um, you, you just grow up and then you, you move into higher positions and then suddenly you're running the organization and you can make your career changes that way and not actually have to jump ship and do a bunch of other things. Healthcare is great. Uh, my father told me I would be a horrible laborer. Uh, and so you better use your mind and work inside because you'll be horrible digging holes and ditches and do other things. Um, so I, I followed his advice and made something of myself. So 
Uh, I'm not out there in 100 degree weather. I'm not out there in the freezing cold weather and I'm not digging holes. Um, I'm doing other types of things and actually saving lives and it's very rewarding and fruitful. So uh, that would be my advice. Thank you, Gary. And we'll end with Christina. Thank you. You know, before I went to respiratory school, my mom, she um, was in the hospital. She had, um, she had had uh, a heart attack and she ended up going into respiratory arrest because she had, um, she threw up while she, during this event, so she aspirated all her stomach contents into her lungs. She um, ended up passing away, but there was always someone bedside. I, I assume they were a nurse, um, but it was a respiratory therapist that was taking care of my mom who would do all the checks on her. Um, and for me and during my personal experience, they were the only people that really reached out to me and explained what was happening to my mom. They, they had enough empathy and enough compassion to really sit down with me and talk to me about the process, what was happening to her lungs, um, all these things that, that stuck with me. And I, again, assumed they were a nurse, um, but there was three in particular therapists who said, no, I'm a respiratory therapist. And I'm like, really? Well, gosh, you're so knowledgeable. You, you know, you have all this information that you, you've been feeding me and I'm so grateful. Um, and it was then that it really clicked to me that this is something that I want to do. Um, and I had asked them, so how do I get started? You know, um, what, I, I want to be in healthcare, what would you recommend? And a lot of them said, you know, kind of like Gary, they pointed me to some of those associations. Um, I went online, but I started looking at job descriptions. So I went to like a career builder, you know, monster. I went to certain um, sites like that and started looking at the job descriptions for different um, things in healthcare, including obviously respiratory therapy. And it was there too that I was amazed at the, the flexibility and how broad um, the, the realm that respiratory therapists can play in respiratory. It was just amazing um, when I was reading all these job descriptions. So. Um, I think if I had any advice is to really look at those job descriptions, see if anything really sticks out to you. I know after my research, respiratory, it was like hands down. That's what I wanted to do. You might still not know, but I like, I like the fact that I have that autonomy and room for growth. And I want to grow. Um, I commit myself to lifelong learning. And so knowing that respiratory therapy could help nurture that was right up my alley. So I advise everyone here to commit themselves to a, a lifelong learning path. And then you will go for very far. Thank you, Christina. And I think that's the perfect way to wrap up our recorded um, section of um, the panel.